Awesome, wonderful to be here. Uh, for those of you I haven't met, I'm, I'm Nicole, and I am the uh, one of the leading experts on on emotion and games, or how emotion drives you know technology and how it drives uh, interactions. We're going to talk a little bit about that in the role of uh, XR. I designed the first iPhone game, and uh, I also created a model called the Four Keys to Fun, which is I actually measured emotion on people's faces while they played and uh, got some deep insights on how interaction and emotion uh, changes a psychology, or how the psychology of interaction works. And uh, we've uh, run a consulting company, Zeo Design, for 26 years. And among the projects we've gotten, um, we basically have used the four keys to add life to The Sims. It's baked into the AI. There we've uh, worked on three in the Mist series. You may have heard of that. And we also did um, iFluence. We worked with uh, Jim Margraff and their team to design a UI uh, for a hands-free, you know, eye-tracking only uh, productivity interface. Uh, Google bought them a couple years ago. Would love to show you that here, but of course it's owned by Google now. And uh, we've also worked on, you know, Star Wars, The Matrix, a number of other uh, leading, you know, Hollywood IPs, you know, creating, creating games and, and interesting uh, gameplay. Uh, so then we've got, uh, a uh, number of clients, other clients in the space. We've done play shops for stuff for, for people like Facebook, their spaces team. We've worked with Eon Reality, Servios, and then most recently uh, with uh, Mariasen. So we've done, uh, you know, I with my team, and we have Michael here sitting in the front row. Uh, we've done, uh, the past for the past four months, we've been haptic designers. So we've been designing haptics, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit. And it's an amazing space, a whole new design frontier that's ahead of us here in XR. Uh, the research that we've done, and uh, I've appeared on a number of different uh, programs. Uh, here I am with Samantha B, uh, working on her, uh, you know, this is not a game, midterm game. A little bit of gamification, get the world of gamification partly comes from our research. And uh, we appeared on the future of work at Singapore. Here's uh, IBM presenting uh, the four keys at TED. And uh, we've also done consulting with uh, the White House. Follow the White Rabbit, we're using um, our uh, experience to actually create our own IP as well. So this is Follow the White Rabbit. It's an XR experience uh, about a magician whose magic one day suddenly works and the rabbit disappears. So a lot of these insights are coming from uh, the four years of uh, development that we've been doing on that game, design and development. And then my earlier game, Tilt World, uh, plants trees in Madagascar. So we close the loop and actually take gameplay and then actually put real trees in the ground. So I know probably most of you are familiar with what UX and UI are, but just so we can be kind of clear, this is how I see the world, is that the UI is really the, inter the, um, the visuals, the audio, the, the haptics, the, the hardware type of stuff, and the UI, the UX is the, uh, the, experience of, the experience of those things in use. I find it helpful to have that separation so as a designer, so that's how I divide those, those terms. And most of what we're doing is going to be on the UX, UX side. So as I said, we've got four to five years in development now. And um, the biggest thing coming from, uh, again, like I've designed things from the first iPhone game, I worked on some of the early audio pens, I've done a lot of different things like this leapfrog, is that we've got now with XR, we really have um, three systems that are coming together. We've got the traditional virtual, the, uh, the virtual world or the, the system model and the user model kind of coming together as an interface. And then we also have the real world. And so we've got this real world, your, 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 the real world, the virtual world, and the person, all of those three circles coming together. And that makes the UI and UX challenge quite a bit harder. Plus, uh, as you know, we are on the cutting edge of everything, uh, and we all know the hardware next year, what we're wearing this year is not gonna be what we're wearing next year. Uh, so I also wanted to look a little bit to the future uh, of what UX uh, experiences might be. And so this is an example from Brigham Young University, so Daniel Smalley there. Uh, has anyone tried or seen a trapped particle display before? Yeah, so these are really amazing things. It's just, it is again super early, but uh, they actually suspend particles in, uh, in the midair and then bounce lasers off of them. So how do you get a real Princess Leia hologram? It's called the Princess Leia Project. And so you can see it in 3D. It's kind of like printing in light. It's like a 3D print of light using these suspended particles and bouncing lasers off of them. Whoa, okay. So um, the alternative title to this talk might have been Avoiding the Hyper-Reality Nightmare, and you know, we will see why. Uh, but I, oh, we all owe, I think, a, big, a, bit, a lot of debt to uh, Kichi Matsuda. Uh, he's got a new piece out now called Merger. I recommend people try it or uh, take a look. It's got a new film. It's really, really good, really good, along the lines of her and some other things. It's a nice short, short piece. 
We see the, it is the seeds of this, of course, already in the early stages of any system because the uh, interactions can be kind of clunky and kludgy at the, at the beginning. And I don't think anyone should be at fault at this or feel bad because we are stumbling. You've got to stumble and you've got to crawl before you can walk, before you can run. And so here we are in the early eight stages. So we see in interfaces now uh, in, in AR a number of different, uh, you know, different shortcomings, a number of different uh, stumbles. We see a clipping of different planes. So we've got uh, in our UI, we're often seeing multiple planes in, in instantiated in the world. And we as users, we want to be able to, or as people, not users, people, in these worlds, we want to be able to move and, and place things in, in, our, in our thing. But that three space really brings up a number of, a number of problems where we have a lot, of, a lot of clutter and then we can have the clipping because if a, um, if a 2D UI pieces element is going through uh, a 3D um, mesh that your system recognizes, then it gets occluded, which makes sense from a um, you know, persistence and create the illusion of the world, but is a real nightmare because the button I want you know, is clipped off by the, um, the flower arrangement in the middle of the conference room table, right? Or my, you know, my internet browser is, is blocking the home menu, right? There's you know, some very interesting stuff that has to happen. Uh, you can also see through walls, so if you don't get the wall right, this is me at a conference, um, and I was actually scanning the uh, hotel room, and so I went into the bathroom, and then there's a mirror there, so it didn't detect that as a wall, so I could see through the mirror into the, uh, the bedroom, and so I could see the bed and the, and, the, and the couch and stuff in the other room, and it was kind of this great, wonderful Alice in Wonderland moment, but you know, still it's these sort of, these sort of mistakes and stuff are, are, um, uh, are inevitable and stuff that we need to learn from and, and really watch, watch for. Uh, you know, of course, not just to say about uh, just Magic Leap, HoloLens 2, still as gorgeous as it looks, will also have some of these problems. Although you see in the demo, they had a really nice, um, a really nice selection. You know, that curved selection they, they did uh, at this uh, at this moment. Able, you were able to grab a whole bunch of screens and then collapse them into a pile and then put them onto the, the thing. At the core of all of this is the screen is no longer two, the uh, the space is no longer a two D space, right? So that we uh, we have the the layering we get in two D is magical because we thought a lot about it um, in the in the early days, interface designers. Um, and then when we take that two D into three D, uh, the three D world, we actually don't have we actually lose a little bit, or we haven't model, modeled the three D space enough. As in my desk, my desk has an, a gravity assist mode. And so when I've got papers running everywhere, you know, as hard as I try, you know, they're going to attach themselves to the nearest horizontal plane. You know, I really, you know, it's that, and, and that is actually to my benefit because, you know, at the end of the day or the beginning of the day or whatever, you know, it's going to be, you know, somewhat organized and I can count on that as a rule. Uh, a lot of UIs in, uh, in XR are going to have to have some rules, maybe not gravity assist mode, but something else that would help, you know, keep people clean, uh, keep, keep workspaces clean and, and organized. So um, the answer to some of this uh, clutter and uh, otherwise, and we only do have 20 minutes, so this can't be a complete uh, workshop on UX for XR. I'm just going to hit the, some of the top points or some top takeaways. And again, they have this sort of future forward uh, design as a design standard design principle uh, so that they will apply you know, next year as well as now. So the first thing that I came up with with this research is that the importance of this screen here. And I think this screen here is the answer to a lot of the, uh, the challenges of uh, UI and UX and avoiding the virtual, you know, it's the hyperspace nightmare, hyperreality nightmare. And this, of course, is white space. So the answer to this is as a design principle, when we're looking at our systems, how much, you need to measure, you have Fitz Law, we also need to have a law about how much white space is in our system. Because we have in three space, we need, of course, to have that zone of interaction, right? in which I am interacting, and I need to bring things into my zone of interaction. It's not just a desktop. That was an easy metaphor, but in three space and a lot of three day space tasks, how do I bring something over to you know, the engine block where the carburetor is and that sort of thing, and how do I push it out of that interaction zone, or how am I not like interacting through the menus? You know, that sort of thing. So we need that white space there for the interaction zone. And then we also need white space so that we can see enough of the reality that we're mapping our, our, our virtual reality to, our augmented reality. We need to see enough of the reality that we can augment it. So we don't want the augmentation to overtake the reality, essentially. Um, because just because we can occlude reality while driving, I don't know if anybody tried that, but it is actually on the floor. We can actually do that. There was actually a demo of that. Uh, you can, we don't, doesn't mean that we necessarily should. So in addition to thinking about how much augmentation we want to do our, in our realities, uh, we also want to make sure that we have plenty of white space because that keeps the person 
in control. And here's some examples of this principle in use. You have the reality button on Magic Leap, so you know, a push of a button, all of the, all of the illusions go away, all, of the, um, all the augmentation disappears, and so you're just looking through the lens, no, uh, no holograms. Uh, and then of course everyone loves the flip up visor, or most people do anyway, of the uh, HoloLens 2. So being able to just flip it up, it's like okay, it's out of the way, and now I can interact with other, with other folks. Uh, we've had some really, uh, some interesting um, experiences with, uh, with North Glass. You know, we were doing that yesterday with Joe, and uh, the, the North Glasses, and uh, it was interesting to get him, to, for him to get a notification. And uh, in that illustration, you might have occlusion just because it's, uh, you might have overage because there's just so much um, information in the new, this is a, a, new, um, a new display that they're, they're rolling out, uh, connected with uh, Google Health Data. Uh, but the, the fact that you've got um, uh, stuff in front of you, uh, the, there's a personal thing, right? You know, where your eyes, his eyes just move just slightly to like read the notification and it was very uncanny. It was like, whoa, wait a minute and uh, a normal, natural kind of flowing expression and stuff like that suddenly became hyper-focused and still. And it, like, it was almost like a zombie, you know, uh, <laughs> had taken over. It's like, wait, what? He froze and he was gonna derez at any moment. I was sure, I was sure. But uh, no, I was really appreciative. He gave me a, a really great, uh, great, great tour of the thing. And then this is uh, another example of white space. This is from the Google guidelines for AR. You know, so using, you know, how do you create enough white space in your app to, um, uh, to keep, uh, to enhance the, the experience. Uh, there's also a white space over time. So this was a, from the AWE last year, uh, where you have sub, you know, sandwich maker kind of thing. And then this is great, great for training, but I don't know if I would want this in front of my face for two hours or five hours or you know, tw uh, 40 hours a week, right? You've got to have, you know, you've got to be able to have that agency to put it away or to have it serve me in terms of an AI rather than me serve it the AI, so that AI, that agency really has to, from an ethical standpoint, we really need to have um, that agency to do our, own, do our own thing. Because above everything else, we really want to avoid, which we, I spoke yesterday about on uh, Brenda Laurel's panel on ethics, we really want to avoid a forced uh, bystander syndrome, right? If it's going to be, you know, if we're going to have to, if we have to see this, because it's so personal, it's so there, and you can't close your eyes really well, and you know, when we close our eyes, when we're wearing these things on contact lenses, you know, when we blink, does the display go off? Right, you know, that's a, that's a, those, those kind of questions are really important. And then, you know, trigger warning, if you're easily disturbed, don't look at this next image, but you know, a lot of these things in my mind are actually gonna look like you know, this, this film from a rather famous movie. Okay, so that these, these experiences can be so intense that you just can't, you know, that you just can't look away. And then we also want in XR to avoid uh, forced uh, agency as well. So if the, uh, if the XR experience it hands you a gun or hands you a, a cigarette or hands you, some, you know, um, a baby or something like that and you have to do something to it in order to advance in the experience, uh, there, there might be some ethical or emotional things that, uh, that, that come up that can be very challenging. So we want to um, avoid, avoid those as well. Related to white is light, and uh, the interesting thing about, as many of you know, um, it's a real problem, real challenge in a lot of AR projected displays is we, it's an additive light display. So can't go into too much of it here, but the idea is that you have to, you can only add light, you can't take it away or as hard with the current generation of hardware. Uh, we definitely understand you know, some other tech that we'd be, we could add to, to this generation to get black, but right now it's really difficult. So most of the black that you see this is a game I just did as a game jam called Pumpkin Smash over Halloween. I put fog on the floor. It's like, okay, so if there's fog, because I want it to be dark and scary, but there wasn't much light, right, and then projected. So I put white fog, so the white would create light um, and close down your eyes a little bit, you know, you know cause your, your pupils to dilate. And then you would see black because, you know, there was so much white in the scene. Uh, and I learned this trick from the folks from uh, Dr. Gordbort's uh, The Weta Workshop. They have amazing steampunk, and they got um, they got highlights on um, they got highlights on metal, and they got the dirty metal. The metal be dirty. And it's like and if you, there's some really interesting illusions. So I highly recommend taking a look at that from a, a design uh, standpoint. Now, um, in addition, we also need the uh, context to shine through. So again, another white space principle. This is an early. Um, uh, this was just a quick port I did of follow the white rabbit onto Magic Leap from uh, you know from Gear VR and you know Oculus Go. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's in a Victorian room. And uh, what, if you just put the full VR room projected, you can, you know, into a real room, 
it doesn't quite, there isn't as quite, it doesn't blend, necessarily blend really well, so we want to be sure that the real world is blending into your virtual one, so that again, there's enough white space in the projection so that you have that opportunity to, to blend the two, because that's where the magic is with augmented reality. It's not a takeover. And on the opposite of white is black, and we've also seen as a best practice, you know, vignetting or closing down the periphery of uh, the, uh, the, you views, uh, the player's or the person's view when they're moving fast. Since we're most sensitive to motion on the periphery, you know, taking away those details or darkening it down when you can, that's mostly obviously with, uh, uh, has to be fully occluded VR or a, a system that's able to occlude uh, like, a, like a handheld um, AR system. So uh, that helps with fast, fast motion and, and other things. So the next thing I'd like to talk about is, uh, is, is emotion and uh, you know, getting emotion through action. The, it's essentially at the point here is what we've discovered by looking at gamers uh, for many, many decades uh, is that emotion comes from their actions as well as the, uh, the, the color and the font and the, um, the, uh, you know, the, the barks that they, you know, they yell out. Uh, I've got more talks if you want to uh, go. This is a, uh, there's a free download on our website at zeodesign.com. And, uh, but real quickly, uh, you, essentially there are sort of four keys. You know, there's sort of, first, at first, in an active system, there's this curiosity. So when we think about a system, there's a curiosity that draws you in. And uh, you want to, uh, you know, so you want to drive the racetrack backwards, right? Or you want to, you know, see where this rabbit hole goes. There's the hard fun of challenge and mastery. So after we explore, we then want to, you know, uh, shoot, uh, you know, basket through a small hoop. Uh, and then there's also people fun, which is, you know, socializing. And then serious fun, which is when the, the whole experience comes together and actually has some meaning or some, creates some value for, for people. And uh, what's interesting about going deeper into XR is that emotions have polarity. And so when we're in XR, we'll often want to move the emotional, some emotions like towards us, some th a feeling of coming towards us or a feeling of going away. So things that have negative affect, negative emotion, we want to push away. So some stuff that's sharp or bloody or whatever we want to push away or disgusting, we want to push away. Uh, stuff that's you know, warm and sweet and curiosity and stuff like that, you want to pull in. And uh, we've been using this to, at, our, at Zio to create um, the groundworks for uh, an emotion engine. And what I want to you know, leave with you folks is that there's an opportunity to look at the interaction and other th ways of creating emotion to actually do, do good for people. So this is a model called, we call DOS. And the idea is that you can, um, through intentional uh, interaction design, cre release, uh, you know, create uh, triggers of these positive, um, these positive feeling emotions. You know, so we know really well how to create fear. Uh, let's also you know, know really how do we create love or how do we create you know, really, really um, you know, social, social bonds uh, there. So I'd like to go, um, so from emotions, we'd want to go to uh, a little bit about, talk a little bit about the spatial, the spatial camera that's uh, unique to, to XR. Uh, this is a scene from Jaws, sort of sped up, and uh, this is what I call a one -er. This is Spielberg's, you know, famous, one of fam famous techniques. It's sped up, but the idea is this is a one long shot, and he uses this to uh, increase emotional intensity. And uh, he's able to do this because they're on a ferry, and the boat creates a frame and so the audience is able to follow it along. And uh, I like to look at this and take it and unpack it because that is, you know, how do, we, how do we create motion and how do we move through things? And every interface has a frame, especially when they pop it off, you know, pop it off of a, a laptop or off a cell phone. So in Follow the White Rabbit, we start in a cafe in Paris and the Eiffel Tower is still under construction and we have these white columns in the corners. So Brandon Jones is the, is the lead artist here. And those white columns provide a context and a frame and a box. It's not a square, it's a rectangle intentionally. So we're using depth, giving you some depth clues, but that helps you understand yourself in that space and keeps you from getting, uh, getting, getting lost. Inside a space, we have uh, the camera changes and has very different uh, roles. I highly recommend if you have a magic leap to try out this, this one, which is a, um, uh, by Air New Zealand. And it's, a, it's, just a, it's just a trivia game show. Uh, but what was very interesting to me is that they had a mix of a shared camera, a universal camera, that show, and everyone showed the same thing. So okay, there was a, we all agree there's a, a flock of birds flying through the air this way, this direction. Um, but when the, Kiwi, uh, when the Kiwi, which is the host, the game host pops on and says, hey, let's play, do you wanna play a game? Uh, then we then switch to individual camera for that. 
So Kiwi always faces you. You never, even though they're on opposite sides of the table, right? So you're always, so Kiwi's always facing you. And then when you go to Havatown or something like that, again, that icon is always, you know, facing, in a sense, facing you. And then when we get like a, a reward, we have a third kind of hybrid camera so that we can all see the golden eggs flying to different people, but from the perspective, from the shared, from different perspectives, depending on, you know, who, you know, who you are. And obviously you'd have your individual just, I can only see my answer card, so what, and what, I, what I'm doing. So there was an interesting, interesting, really interesting use of camera there. Now we have, uh, cameras can be super engaging, and uh, we can, uh, as most systems now, we, when we're doing in XR, in, in augmented reality, we have to have that, that setup step. And I think there's some really interesting ways of making that more fun as a best practice. And one is, uh, I really like with, I think it's Project Create on Magic Leap, where you have this Easter egg hunt and you have to you know, f look at the circles, and this is starting to become a best practice on a lot of systems now. They have that, the thing fills up on the far left, so it, the, the little thing, the wheel fills up as you go, which is super, which is super great and super fun. Uh, but then my, my friend uh, Patrick O'Shaughnessy here from Patch Reality, uh, you know, uh, shared with me this, his app, his new app, um, uh, Babel Rabbit, and I was like, oh my gosh, this is even better, because now it's themed. So in a sense of best practice is you wanna make calibration and meshing, fun activity themed to the world. And it's a rabbit, you know, and you go around, but instead of this triangular mesh, which wouldn't work with the world at all, uh, Patrick and his, his guys and girls, um, his, his team, you plant clover and you plant seeds and stuff like that. So it's very in theme with the idea of a rabbit. And then you can see if there's no clover there, it hasn't meshed yet and I gotta plant clover. That's much more mass market than a bunch of triangles, a bunch of tries. Uh, so yeah, so now we're gonna look at uh, UI anchors and controls. We have a whole host of different, um, a whole host of different, uh, you know, UI hardware hit, hitting our hands here and other things, all the way from one DOF and three DOF systems. So the North has a simple, you know, kind of a simple thumb, obviously glass as well, uh, and then you know, gestures and eyes could probably be infinity DOF. I don't know. There's a, quite a few more. And so when you're creating an experience, you want to go across many platforms, like we're doing with Follow by Rabbit. We want to be able to have like the really high fidelity system like, uh, like Index where you can actually have individual fingers moving around to where I'm just, uh, you know, just holding a 3 off controller or we're, we're actually using, using gaze. Uh, more proof that we've got a challenge on the UX uh, uh, with the controllers is this modified grip. Anybody use a modified grip for playing Beat Saber? How many people play Beat Saber? <laughs> and, then, and then wait, so Beat Saber players, right? All right, and then how many people use a modified grip? Well, there you go. All right, you have your, your homework. Yeah, it actually, it actually, I don't know, 10, 20% improving in, on your score if you use a modified grip. So look it up. Yeah, Claw's the most, yeah, Claw's the most uh, popular. You just stick your fingers through the hole on a Vive controller. Uh, yeah, it's totally, it's a game changer. Literally a game changer. Thank me later. Um, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> yeah, so those of you who have not gotten expert mode, there you go, that's your, that's your key. Uh, so spatial UX, one, one more thing is that, you know, we obviously can map, you know, why not map, make our menus 3D? Why not map them to our controllers? Now this again is another anchoring experience. So it, you're anchoring to, um, to the controller with uh, something like tilt brush, uh, but it might be other kinds of objects. So here's a concept of, you know, anchoring it to a watch. So if you guarantee that you've got some kind of hardware on your hand, then you might be able to uh, do, you know, do some kind of targeted, you know, AR. And then, um, or again with uh, Kichi's uh, stuff, this is sort of his demo from uh, Project North Star, which probably most of you have seen, where he's using that mesh to just anchor the, anchor the experience because he can assume that most people have, uh, have a, uh, a, a hand. That's not all, all true, not everybody does have one, both hands, but you know, you've got a nice way of anchoring the menus without being, you know, being more seamless. So I'm running low on time. We have a little bit, can I go a little bit longer? All right. Pinch and drag is another, uh, yeah, you might have a right, no, I don't. Uh, so pinch and drag is rapidly becoming a standard. So we had point and click, we have tap and swipe for iPhone or uh, Android, and now we have click, um, we have pinch and drag, uh, which I think is a great, is a definitely a great, uh, great way to, to, uh, to advance the interface forward. However, um, it depends on the pinch, the pinch gesture. So when I pinch and dra grab, I think you wanna really look at what is that gesture, like what is comfortable for the hands, because a lot of these systems have you do this, and this is not, this is not comfortable. I mean, you can do some fun dances that way, right? 
Um, but you know, it's not super comfortable. Uh, my hint for HoloLens One is just to do puppet mouth. Obviously, I have a reason for liking puppet mouth otherwise, but it's much more comfortable. So you really want to look at the strain for your pinch and drag. Uh, you know, it's really, you know, this is a much more comfortable pinch and probably not so, not so fun to be able to, um, um, to track. Uh, this, is a, this is really great work from Greg Crawford at NASA JPL where you're actually able to grab something um, and, and this is like really working in 3D. So it isn't just XY plus a little depth. A lot of people start that way. There is, um, in these 3D interfaces, there's a lot of pitch and a lot of yaw if you think about flying. And then so here he's locking, he's getting a system, a UI system for locking pitch and yaw or locking directionality so that he could just grab that wheel off a rover and then move it in one, in one direction. So very cool. In button land, we have uh, being able to punch buttons. Uh, we want to be sure that we minimize multi-finger interaction until you have multi-finger haptics. Uh, the, you know, some folks from Holland's team were saying that, you know, that the buttons would jump up to your hands. But if you're typing, I don't know if you can see this too well, but which, which finger am I intending to hit the keyboard, right? You know, it's, uh, it's very hard to tell from, uh, you know, from the bottom, like which, which one it is. And so you'll see that most people are doing just a one at a time thing as opposed to a multi-finger. And nobody likes, nobody likes keyboards in, in simulated. Uh, project, um, Dr. Gerbart though does a really good job with buttons. He's got an expert mode where you punch it all the way through and it's just done. Or a beginner mode where you, where you, you put it through and then you just wait and you can see the, the thing go up. So he's supporting beginner and expert user at the same time. Ours we have a little bit better, I um, mean a little bit more, uh, uh, less, uh, less UI system, it feels a little bit more natural, is it simply a gaze-based system for Follow White Rabbit where we have 3D and depth in the cursor layer. And I think that's very, that was very important for our, our game. You look at clues just with a gaze, so on the low end, they'll come towards you. We'll have hand interaction as well, but they come towards you and then there's a 3D depth uh, effect which won't, won't show on a 2D screen. And that actually is really increasing the, uh, the amount of comfort that we're, that we're getting. So uh, in hands and gestures, we want gestures to feel like unspoken. This is a great game if you haven't played it. It feels amazing. I want more story and stuff like that, but if you haven't tried like a magic game, it's really cool. We really want this effortless novel, like this is uh, using leap motion to navigate, um, ma navigate the planet uh, for uh, the German Chamber of Commerce in San Francisco. And you want to just fly, right? You want that feeling of flight. You want these gestures to be really fluid. But gestures now are really discrete, you know, we want, they're really discrete poses. You know, and they're very, you know, tapped. You know, it's just very, very, um, very, uh, very discreet, very hard. Um, and then you also have to learn them. So this is the tap interface, right? You have to, this is courting. And, um, and then this is a, uh, a touch gesture reference guide I pulled off the internet. Uh, and then if you want to think, like, well, what do we do with our hands? So this is hand symbols, I think, from, uh, you know, from uh, uh, an Indian dance, uh, their madras, yeah? And then what we, uh, what we want to do, though, is we want to have for Aladdin, which is the chapter in White Rabbit, we really want to have this fluid thing that we could you know, just, you know, just, just go through. Uh, and so we want to bring in, um, we want to bring in uh, 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 context and, uh, and, do, and do some stuff like that. But since I'm, I'm really running out of time, I'm sure they're going to kick me off the stage. Uh, just wanted to do a, one thing about video twi uh, digital twins. So we want to look at these digital overlays and how they interact with it. We want to bring things up uh, for players or for users or for people. We want to bring them up and we want to throw them, put them away. And then if they don't have 3D, we may want to have like mini dollhouses, like this is the Wayfair catalog, as well as bringing them into our space. We want to have, may want to have both, both kinds of views uh, as, we, as, we go, as, we go, as we go through. And then in the context in the real world, like if we have our T-Rex recognize our sneakers or something and have our T-Rex, our virtual T-Rex like, you know, attack us, you know, our physical world, right? And then like in White Rabbit, when, we dip, when, we, when, you, when you spill dark magic, something happens to that real world object in the game for the rest of the life of the game. So having the virtual world come back into the real world, those are gonna be really, really magical, uh, magical moments. And um, we need to have, uh, be sure that we have Collaboration, we need eyeline, very important. And when we context and we personalize, we want to be sure that it, um, it's expressive and it's performant and it's worth sharing. Uh, because what we want is we want to create, uh, with these lenses and stuff like that, we really want to create <laughs> uh, this sense of shared wonder. And on the ethical side, 
uh, you know, this is all me, actually. Uh, you know, we want to also like look at uh, look at the uh, look at the uh, ethics of like, well, if there's only one form of beauty that we're all you know getting uh, pushed towards, what is the ethical implication of that, right? And there are already people getting uh, cosmetic surgery, so they look better on selfies. Like a selfie camera distorts your face. They're actually getting people trying to make their selfies look better. Well, um, you know. I wish I looked more handsome on the left. I have no idea who that woman is in the middle. And then, oh yeah, that, that, that was just kind of cute. I don't think I ever looked like that when I was a kid. But you know, hey, whatever. <laughs> so, um, and as a, as a final point, don't forget haptics. So this is uh, Mariah since we just finished um, a, a great demo for them. Uh, they couldn't be here at the show, but definitely keep their eye out because it's directional, it's, it's textural. Uh, we had a really interesting, interesting time. All the surfaces in the demo are, you can touch them. So the difference between the bubbly glass and the stainless steel, and the you know, and the uh, and here we've got this great interactive sculpture. You could put your hand in it, and you can actually feel the hologram. Your hands pass through the hologram, uh, so really keep an eye out out for them. Here we're actually uh, sanding off the the, the uh, flanges off a, a rover door, so you can feel the, the the smooth stainless steel, and then the rough metal that you're you're sanding away. And you can feel the sander in your hands. Again, great directional uh, directional stuff. And uh, since audio is always short shifted, we're going to do that as well. But uh, the, my big takeaway there is uh, traditional audio, we design it towards the inside, right? And then what we really want is uh, in VR and XR, we really want it towards the out, right? You're basically designing where it is in the room. So you're kind of taking all your design parameters and just flipping them the other, the other way. Uh, so everything about uh, design XR um, should be the, um, the other, yeah, in the other, in the other direction. And uh, you know, when we create volumetric, the illusions, we want to create them uh, audio-wise audio, audio -wise as well and haptically as well. So I've got a list of best practices. And uh, if you want to give me your business card, I've got a, um, a ton more, believe it or not. There's, I think there's about 50 of them. So if you want to give me a business card or tweet me or email me, uh, you know, I'd, ha I'd be happy to, to pass that out. And here are those, those contact details. So thank you very much. Thank you.